Well, welcome everyone. Um, really excited to have Rachel with us again. I was looking through our archives and saw it was back in September, the last time um, she taught us on the block. So it's been a minute. And in that time frame, she's done and accomplished a lot. We'll get to all of that, I'm sure. But, um, and Rachel's coming to us from England. She's in London. And mm -hmm. we might have a little bit of lag time on internet if anyone's watching the replay. So just be aware of that and the differences in bandwidth might have something to do with that. So welcome, Rachel. We're glad to have you. Thank you. So glad to be here. Yeah, well, tell us a little bit about your writing journey. What and and bring us up to you know current day. What what you've been working on? Yeah, uh, so I started as an English major. So I have a degree in um, English education and taught for a little while, and then um, started writing a novel when my son was born. And that was a long process. It took about mm, thirteen years to find a publisher and to write it and to 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 make it worthy of publication. It was a very long process. Um, wrote two books since then that were self-published. The first one was with a small uh, Christian publisher and did some writing for various magazines and articles um, and book anthologies. And um, now have just, I have a young adult fiction coming out in the UK on May 6th and then July 1st in the US. So, and that's with a UK based publisher who also has a presence in the US, which was really appealing to me. Um, they're called 10 of those, 10 publishing. And they started an imprint called Reformation Lightning, which is their new teen tween um, imprint. They just felt like there was a need in that market for uh, biblically, um, it's it's Christian. It's a Christian publisher, but they want books from a biblical perspective that are not Christianese, which is right up my alley. That's that's really like my sweet spot. Um, so they were um, the editor was new and looking to build this imprint. So by God's grace, he got in contact with me, and last May I signed the contract, and the book's coming out about a year later, which in the publishing world is pretty quick, but it's yeah. young adult. So it's a little, it's a shorter, you know, it's a short, shorter manuscript. Um, but we're in London. I do a lot of writing for ministries and churches. I do a lot of curriculum writing for kids and curriculum writing for internationals. One of the ministries we're involved with is ESL. Hi, Kathy. And I find that writing for kids and internationals as a ministry mm -hmm. is there's a lot of crossover, which is really beautiful. Um, so I do a lot of writing. Cool. My, my weeks are spent with lots and lots of writing, but mo most of it is, um, well, except for in this season, I was going to say most of it is not my own novel article writing. It's for other ministries, but in this season with the book, that's been, obviously that's been a little, has to be a little off balance. So I've poured more into the book than I have, but yeah, I'm, yeah, I love, it sounds... I love yeah you're doing all kinds of different types of writing um, with the curriculum writing and, and that kind of thing, plus the fiction writing. Is it hard for you to switch back and forth? Um, it's not so hard anymore. I think the more writing you do and the more you dip your toes into different genres, you, you, you come to find your voice and that kind of uh, will, my voice is kind of the same wherever I write. And so it's now that I feel more confident in my voice, I feel more confident to switch the genres. Mm. So I probably will never be a really academic heavy writer because that's just not my voice. But when I write for different ministries, it's usually really conversational. So it's still, you know, it's still my voice. So I'm switching genres, but I'm not really switching um yeah, who I am as a writer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to um, get to, you know, th this whole journey of switching publishing houses or is that publishing companies 
that you've done self-publishing and now you're being traditionally published. Is that, am I getting that correctly? Yep, that is right. Yeah. So how has that played into this process for you? Has it been a very vastly different experience? Yeah, I think um, there's differences. There's so many factors. So there's, yes, there are differences between self-publishing and traditionally publishing. And there are differences between, I'm finding, um, working with publishers in the UK who are UK based versus the US. And there's actually a lot of differences in platform building between the UK and the US and what is just kind of the norm and expected and how, um, how I as an American would think about marketing my book is a little bit different than how I would market it to a UK audience. So there's all, they, there are all these layers. Um, yeah, self-publishing, um, this is pro I don't think I'm saying anything new, but the pros are obviously you get control completely. Uh, so you can, you don't have to, um, obey a editor. It's all you, the, and the, one of the reasons why I self-published my second novel was that it did not fit into Christian fiction, but it had some some overtones of spirituality that I just wasn't sure if a, a secular publisher would be interested in. And honestly, I did not even shop it around. That might have been a mistake. I don't know. But I just I just was at the point where I'm like, I'm going to self-publish. My husband's actually quite techy, so he could help me with a lot of the components that I, I struggled with. Um, so it felt like the right choice. Um, the con, the biggest con, I think, is that when you are working with a traditional publisher and, a, and an editor who is completely separate from you, so not anyone who's connected with you in any way, you will grow as a writer in ways that you would not grow if you self-published. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this varies too on the publisher that you're you're working with, but my current editor, um, yeah, he's just been great. He's, he, there, there's a kind of a fantasy and mysterious element to my new book, which is called the girl on the tube, meaning the girl on the underground, London underground. Um, and th there's a character, this lady with the green hat, she pops up all the time. And I really liked the mystery of her, but I really was really unclear. Like, what? I don't know what I'm doing with her. I just like this idea of my main 12 year old character running into her. And, but I was struggling with how to make it work with the, the main storyline, which is she's trying to fit in and belong. She moved from America to London with her dad. You find out as you read that the mom's not in the picture. So you get little, you know, as you read, you find it more and more. And then this lady in the green hat just shows up on the train. And um, it's just, they have these moments. And I almost dropped that because I, I said, I just, I'm not sure what, I, I don't know why I'm drawn to this. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with this. And he um, pushed me to keep going. And he said, this is actually the reason why I was interested in this project. And he said, <laughs> your book will work if you take this out you still have a really solid story, but this is gonna set it apart. And this is really what's gonna intrigue a lot of readers. And so he kind of pushed me to think of this character as a metaphor for Addie, my main character, facing her grief. So when she's missing home or she's missing her mom, um, this lady pops up and, and I'm not gonna spoil it, but you know the relationship kind of gets teased out. And then at the end of the manuscript, I realize I'm like, oh, I know who she is. And now actually I think there needs to be a sequel because now I have like all these big plans for what's going to happen. Ugh, but but had he that? not told, you know, had he, had I not had an editor who would have pushed me, I probably would have dropped it because that's not in my wheelhouse to write fiction. I don't read a lot of fantasy sci-fi, so that's not really where my head goes. Um, but he really pushed me to, to keep at it and keep, keep pushing along and yeah, I'm really thankful. So had I self-published, I, I, I would have dropped that. Um, so a good editor will make you better. And I mean, that hurts there, you know, there, the story is about um, editors cutting scenes that you love and that you worked and you spent days and weeks on are true. And they have, you know, they do have the authority to do that so that there is a yielding of, it's not just your project anymore. It's, it's, your project together 
Um, so you do have to kind of come to terms with that. But for me, um, you know, it's worth it because I feel like the, the end result, the end story is better for it. Having that distant, not my friend who's, you know, has he's invested in it as a product. The publishing house is invested in it as a product. I think this publisher is also invested in it as a ministry. I really do believe that. And I love that they have a heart for ministry um, and they want to get as much Christian books or books that have a point to God. They want that out in churches in the world. So, and I believe that. I don't think that's just a, you know, a tagline, um, but they're also a business. So, you know, they need to produce books and material that they know are going to sell. Well, there's so much in that story that I really love. I love that the editor really kind of pushed you to keep going with something. And you didn't like you were on the process of discovery through the through the writing process itself. So that is really intriguing and kind of fun to hear, because I just think that so often, you know, no matter what you're writing, there is that discovery that happens for all of us, like, I don't really know where I'm going <laughs> with this until, you know, you just have to keep, keep trying to figure it out. So that that's really fun. So you're going to talk to us just kind of about how to write better stories. And I think you're a great person to teach us. So tell us a little bit. I mean, I don't want to get into Thursday's teaching yet, but where, where do you start? Like, um, you know, what kind of like emotions should we be feeling or do you draw a lot from your own personal experience and circumstances in order to kind of create a story? Hmm. Yeah, I think you hit it that it does start with emotions for me um, and teasing that out. So um, in particular, this current story where I'm, so when we moved to London five years ago, we moved with, um, our 13 year old daughter and myself and my husband, and we left our son who had just started university in the States in, yeah, we, we <laughs> somewhat settled him in September and then we moved October 20th. Um, and that was brutal that season was brutal on all of us. And mm -hmm. in a big way, we all broke. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, God was in it and it wasn't the wrong decision that we made, uh, but it still broke us. And for the longest time, I could not write really anything about it because it just felt so huge and overwhelming. Um, I might write like a, I, I could write from the emotional standpoint of maybe grief or missing home, but I couldn't actually write about our experience. So I think that was, you know, clearly it was something we were dealing with. It was in the back of my, my mind. It probably was coloring a lot of the other pieces I was working on and hopefully like an empathetic way. I was hopefully being more empathetic to problems that I didn't have experience in just because you know, when you go something that's go through something that's unique, it's, it, it is unique, but that means that you understand when other people go through things that you don't fully understand, you can say, I know I don't fully understand, but I, I understand that that was like a, a big hard thing for you. Um, but I don't, I couldn't write from a place of, um, feeling wounded because it was too raw. And I think, there is some wisdom in letting yourself go through an experience without feeling the pressure to write about it because we're probably not ready. And well, I should preface that. Write about it, but don't don't write about it for an audience. Just write about it for yourself in your journal, you know, prayers to God. Like I'm I should separate those two. Definitely write about it. Like my journal is filled with like ink and tears and all sorts of things like but it's very poorly written it's just like here's my verbal you know spew for the day um, but in terms of thinking about writing for an audience I think usually it's probably best 
to have some distance between um, those really acute emotional experiences. So you can step out of yourself and think about how what you're going to share is actually going to serve your audience. Because writing, I think initially writing is incredibly self-absorbed. And I don't think that's bad. It's it's just our way to process emotions and think about what we're going through. And um, it it should start from a place of ourselves. And that's that's fine. It's good. It's healthy. But if we're going to, if if our aim is to write to get something into the world, I think there there needs to be a little bit of distance of um, what can I do with this? What can this spark? Like what what idea, now that I've gone through this, what emotion can I um, tease out and maybe turn into, if we're talking about fiction, turn into a story, or if we're talking about an article, and now you have the emotional experience to bring to this particular um, article. Instead of, uh, if I, yeah, if I, if I wrote this story when I was feeling like I was the 12 year old girl and feeling just terribly awkward and self-conscious and trying to figure out a different culture and um, going from small town Wisconsin life to, you know, having a car and dropping my kids off at school to London where we don't have a car. It's, we're like this with our neighbors. My daughter took the bus, the city bus and the train and the tube to get to school. Mm -hmm. She had a 45 minute commute and that's the norm. Like I went to, it would have been too raw and it would have been too much, too much about me. And that's the other great thing about, I think about fiction is that I can, as a writer, you can take the emotional truth and pour it into a story that is not about you. And so you can, you can take the truth and then just lie and, and make something <laughs> up based on, based on what you know to be true. And that's, yeah. I mean, to me, that's the beauty of fiction is that we are not only showing um, truths about humanity and grief and joy and, and the, the things that a non-Christian could point to too, but as Christian writers, we are pointing to a greater truth, even if we're not writing Christian fiction, because we're, we're at a place where we know why we're here. We know that we're image bearers. We know that everything reflects God or is, was created to reflect God, including us. So including the work that we produce, that's going to naturally come out of our writing, of our story. So we can, um, we can be really free to not stay in the little parameter of Christian fiction and there needs to be a conversion store. You know, somebody needs to become a Christian and there needs to be this line and, um, and just let our selves give that tone to the story. So for instance, the, um, the girl on the tube, I don't mention Jesus at all. I think I mentioned God twice, but once because it's Thanksgiving. So they're explaining to their, their assortment of, of internationals around their Thanksgiving table, what Thanksgiving is. And they say, it's, we thank God or the pilgrims, you know, came together with the native Americans and they thank God. Uh, but there's nothing in it that is, that is Christian in the sense of, I'm not explaining the gospel at all. But there are metaphors and layers to the characters where there's a lot of um, interplay with the 12 year old daughter and her father. And at one point in the story, she rebels. And so there's a, you know, there's, there's a coming back together with her father. And so there's a lot of space for me to talk about, uh, not in a Christian way, but just from the character's perspective of, of missing that, you know, realizing she broke her dad's heart, realizing she wants to be home and not where she, she ended up. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that as Christian writers, fiction, that's why I love fiction. Um, we can, it's almost like the winsome way to share our faith that mm -hmm. we're, we're just letting ourselves 
color what we write. And my my fr my Muslim friends who um, I actually, for one of the scenes I talked to um, quite a lot with a, a former Muslim who's now by God's grace, a Christian. And so like, but my other Muslim friends will accept this book. There won't be anything that's offensive. And I'm so glad. And it, it opens up conversations for, you know, all sorts of things. So to me, it's like this, I can share the gospel in a way that you don't even know I'm sharing it, but maybe God's using this to kind of knock on the door and plant some seeds and just make you think about something differently because I'm, I'm writing from the perspective of you're an image bearer. I'm an image bearer. I know why God put us here and that's going to come through. So yeah. it feels a little bit like missions in a very, it's a little like covert, yes, <laughs> covert yes. missions. Yeah. Um, a couple things you said, you were talking about just like when to write about, like you start with emotion and mm -hmm. you're probably drawing on this experience that you had when you were moving overseas, leaving a child behind, how difficult that was, that would be your character is 12 year old girl doing the same thing. So you could infuse that character with so much realness because you, you, you went on a similar journey as her. So, so are you, um, I, I don't know if that's your normal practice. Is that something you would advise um, someone who might be toying with the idea of writing fiction or who somebody who already does like start with something big in your life and see where those, what, what feelings you felt and see how you can transfer that into a story. Is that a good strategy? I think it can be. I think that's one way to start. Um, that's that hadn't been my practice before so with the other two books um with my first one called mother of my son it's about a, a very beginning about a girl who abandons her newborn at a dumpster and then think thinks that he has he's dead but years later she and the birth she and the adoptive mother meet and don't know each other's identity so it's a story of this friendship that mm -hmm. what happens when the the son who's now 18 what happens when that identity comes out. So that had nothing to do with, um, I didn't have any experience in any of that. In fact, we, we did adopt, but it was after, it was after this book was, um, a couple drafts were already done. It wasn't published yet, but, um, but that came about from listening to a news story when I was a brand new mom about a, a girl who left her baby at a, at a prom, like in the bathroom. It was just this tragic story. And so my mind went, what is going to happen to that girl? And what is going to happen to that baby? And what, what could happen if this happens? So I think one tactic is to um, recognize when something has grabbed your attention, whether it's tragic like that or happy or somewhere in the middle, and just allow yourself to, to think through the what if possibilities. The what if question is really powerful in terms of helping us spark ideas. So we, again, we're taking something that's true. That news story I saw was true, but then I was, I was like, well, what if this happened? What if that happened? Um, in the news story, the baby had died, but what if the baby hadn't died? And what if she thought the baby had died? And what if, what happens when this girl is met with, what if a Christian stepped into her life? What if she, you know, what if she read the gospel of John? Like it, it just, it kind of kept building on what if. So I think um, that's a really good tactic of just paying attention to, to the things that stop you and grab your attention and, and then teasing them out and playing with them and, and being free to like brainstorm all sorts of maybe even ridiculous ideas, knowing that, you, you know, you're not going to, follow you're not going to follow all of them you're not going to chase every single one but one idea can lead to another um and then the my other novel um is called the ground beneath us and that is about a a wife who wants to run away from her <laughs> her home and i honestly i don't know where 
I don't know where that one came from. I just like the idea of um, what does it mean to be a friend when, like, what would it be like if you had a friend who was in that circumstance? And at that point I hadn't, but we had, you know, I had gone through some other friend things where sometimes a friend would have to say something hard to me. And it, boy, it was a really uncomfortable situation, but I'm glad she did. Or I would have to say something to, to a friend. Um, and yeah, I, I think somewhere in my memory, I remember either hearing about or reading or something about this mom who like went up in a tree house and she was just tired of like telling her kids to do the dishes and do it, do all the things. So she like went up in this tree house and like stayed there for a week. And I don't even know where that came from. Like, I think I heard this. I don't think I made that up, but I just thought that was so funny. Like, yeah. what did she do in the tree? Like, how did she eat? And like, that could be a whole book on its own, but there was something that it's somewhere along the lines I picked up on that. And I liked the idea of this mom who wasn't a runner at all, um, running away. And she ends up in her, her, her friend's, um, kids, uh, outdoor play area. Like it's just, it just was the beginning. That was, it wasn't the plot. That was just the beginning, but then taking it from there and what, you know, what do you, if you're married, you know, that you're going to hit a, a season where you think, well, this is really hard. I kind of want out. Like, that's just a reality. I have not, you know, met anyone who's been married for longer than, I don't know, maybe a year, maybe five years. I don't know, but that's just a reality. Like sometimes you just want out. So what do you do with that? And if you, and if you have a friend or if you yourself are like, nope, I want out, how does that push the friendship? And what does that mean to be a, a good friend and yeah, to bring about yeah. that hard truth? Yeah. I love the, the letting your mind wander. And I I had a recent experience this, this weekend. I went and visited this mansion that is now a, a museum. And I was just like, my mind was just going like crazy. I was like, what was it like to live here and to come out on your Juliet balcony? And I, you know, I kind of shut it down in my own mind right away. Cause I was like, eh, you know, that's silly, but I hearing you talk is making me think, oh, maybe I should have like allowed myself, given myself permission to kind of tease that out a little bit more because I think we are naturally curious. Maybe it's just that the older we get, the less curious, I don't know, we we can sometimes become mm -hmm. uh where we, you know, we're too busy telling the kids to put things away, you know. And right. we'd rather be up in the treehouse, like Space said. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of a universal thing, maybe. Well, um, so we talked a little bit too, just about how you can use your fiction writing and not be explicit in your gospel telling. It can be implied subtly. Do you think there are other things that um fiction can do better um, than maybe nonfiction writing in, in that in that regard? Yeah, I think the story has the power to present truths that we can accept that we maybe wouldn't be able to accept otherwise. When we when we get it, when we're absorbed in a story where our defenses are down, I mean, the, the standard example is David and, you know, Nathan the prophet coming to him. He was wrapped up in the story about the little lamb, so his defenses were down, and then you know, it took Nathan to actually point out the fact that, you know, you are that man, David, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, but I, I think, I mean, you know, Jesus, the fact that he spoke in parables, some he did not explain, some, some he just left hanging, some he did explain, but I love that some he didn't explain, and he was okay with that, like, some are going to pick up on it, some aren't, that's okay, I'm just, I, I'm kind of in this season with um, reading the Bible where I'm just struck with how much God loves story and how it's so built into God's word. Like it, it, it's, this is historical. It's a historical book. I get that. But within that, it's just, it's his overarching story of redemption. But then within that, there's, you know, just the fact that we know these specific stories about people throughout history that he, he sees fit to include these specific stories um, and, and the use of metaphor and simile and 
word pictures and emotive, you know, things that are meant to make us um, invoke our emotions. It's, it's really a, it, it's just a reminder that God is the one who created story. And it's a, it's a worthy way to communicate. And I think, yeah, I think the best way to communicate something that your audience will remember is through story, whether that's spoken or written. We tend to forget facts. I do. I'm sure there are, you know, there are exceptions to this, but I think most people would retain a story because they have an emotional connection than they would a list of facts. So what a great place to, yeah, what a great place to, to bring in some, yeah, to, to open up the door to, to maybe bring in some information or bring in truth or, or bring in facts in a way that's just easily, easily accessible for us. Well, I notice like in church, whenever a, a pastor tells a story, like it's a, it's kind of this little mind break sometimes too. And you can kind of see people lean, lean in or sit up a little straighter, like they engage more. So it has yeah. this power of drawing people in kind of, um, like shocking the system a little bit to kind of think about something in a fresh way. So I, I mean, I see that too, just kind of in daily, daily life. So, um, so how did we, you talked about earlier, just all the different kind of work that you do and the kind of crossing over that you do and that you felt more confident now that you have found your voice. Um, that's one of those things that I think a lot of us, you know, we're not even really sure what that means, number one, and then we're not even sure what our voice is or how to find it. That's a big loaded question, but could you kind of kind of distill a little bit what you mean by that and how you found your voice? Finding your voice takes a lot of writing and a lot of time. I mean, there's, I don't think there's a shortcut. Um, the more writing you do, the more you realize uh, your specific way of saying things. And it doesn't mean that before you find your voice, like if you're in that stage, where you're like, I don't know if I have a voice. You, you obviously you have a voice because you're writing. And it doesn't mean that what you're writing, if you're feeling unsure about that you haven't found your voice. It doesn't mean that it's invalid. I honestly don't think I found my voice until after the, at least the first novel was published. And that was with the traditional publisher. And I look at that now and I still like it, but I'm like, it's not, I haven't really found, found my voice yet. So what that means is that if you can pick out who's writing these words based on, it just matches everything they else they say. So like, you know, if you read C.S. Lewis a lot, you can pick out his voice from other writers. If you read Steinbeck, you can pick out his voice compared to like Dickens, like those two are so polar opposite. You can pick out, you know, just how they say things. Um, so it, yeah, I think it takes time, uh, experimentation, just experimenting with different forms of writing, even if it's just for the sheer joy of it or the sheer of like discovery of what am I thinking about this? Or like, you know, trying your hand in fiction, like you were describing that place, Kara, like even if you spent 10 minutes just jotting that, like just pretending you're a fiction writer and just wearing that hat momentarily and be like, I'm just gonna pretend I'm a fiction writer and I'm just gonna write a scene based on this place that I, I just visited. Just to, to, you know, try out that voice. I think that's part of you, even if you don't do anything else with fiction, that would help you you know, develop your voice with nonfiction because it's all in the realm of writing. Mm -hmm. um, I will say, I'll share this story because I, I think hopefully it'll be encouraging. It's a, it's a failure story on my part. So a couple of years ago, it was during COVID, we were living here and um, we're, the reality of missions is we're, you know, we're always support raising. That's just part of it. And London's a crazy expensive city. So I was looking for part-time work and I somehow stumbled upon um, um, Truth For Life. I was debating if I should say the name, but I'm going to, because I love them. And I, I, I have nothing but good, good things to say about them. Um, I, I stumbled upon a 
a, a job advertisement to be a writer for Truth For Life, which is the Alistair Begg um, radio program. And long story short, I got the job and it was remote, so I could do it from London and it was writing. So I thought, this is amazing. It was with a ministry. Um, and it was to write all the bits for the in-between part. So if you, not on the, not if you listen to a podcast, but if you're on the radio, Bob Levine comes on and he says a little introduction and then he says some more and then he introduces the message. And then usually there's like a book promo. They, they promote some book. All of those bits are written by a writer, not Bob Lapine. So my job was to learn how to write those parts. And it was me and another woman who was a, a volunteer up until this point with that ministry. And I had like on paper, I had way more experience than she did. But I, after three months, and this was like kind of a, I was working, but it was a trial period. After three months, um, my supervisor said, this just isn't working. You just, you're not getting the voice. And it was like, I was working so hard. So that, so there are certain words that Bob Lapine wouldn't say. There are certain phrases that, you know, it has to be, it has to capture the same consistent voice that you would hear. Um, and I just wasn't getting it. Um, I think part of the problem too, is the remote thing. we both realized the remote thing wasn't working, that I really did need to be closer to kind of um, absorb what they wanted, but it was it was all about the voice. But I think partly why that didn't work out is because I had developed my voice and I couldn't give it up. Like once I found mm -hmm. it, I'm like, I don't know how to not write. I'd be, I probably would be a terrible ghostwriter. I don't know. I don't know how to not write. I'm having a hard time shutting that off. And it's taking so much energy where I could be spending it on writing things that I'm actually, you know, that are coming from me. Just, just, yeah, it just wasn't a good fit. And they, and they did hire the woman um, who had not a lot of writing experience, but she was able to pick up and understand what it meant to adopt that voice. Um, and it was, an, it was a nice job. Like it was a really, yeah, it was a, a really nice job. So I an encouragement that there are writing jobs out there that actually pay somewhat decently for a ministry um, that you don't have to be this experienced experienced writer to do actually in that case it was it was to her advantage that she didn't have as much experience and it was to my disadvantage that maybe I, I did there could have been some other things too I don't know but that was like the main thing we kept coming back to is this is this is your voice Rachel this isn't Bob you're not capturing Bob Lapine's voice so <laughs> Yeah, there you go. It is, I mean, it, you know, it's it, there are a million different voices, right? Because we yes. all have this unique perspective of looking at life and the way we express that. Yeah, I've experienced that too in copywriting work where I'm trying to write something for a client to make it sound like the client has written this. Um, yeah, and so I have, you know, I ask them, like, what do you say? What don't you say? and try and weave that into some of the copy because, but yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to, to do. And yeah, I get that I, the less experience you are, maybe the bit more beneficial or, you know, you have a little leg up on that too. Yeah. Or may, and, and that's such a valid job in the writing world that maybe that voice is just the ability to take on and switch voices. I don't know. I, I just don't have that, but that, I mean, that in itself could be part of your voice that you could be a little bit of a chameleon and, and absorb other people's point of view in a way and, and yeah, use your words. So, um, I, yeah, I guess there isn't a, it, it, while I'm saying, yeah, you want to develop your voice, it, it, I guess put, you know, make it broad where it could include that, like being able to tell other people's stories from their voice. Well, and I think too, like, have you had, like you said, you read that first novel and you were recognizing you didn't know your own voice. Have you, you know, anyone on the call had that experience too, where you read something that you wrote a few years ago and you're like, oh, <laughs> that's, I don't talk like that. Like that doesn't, that doesn't sound like me anymore. You know, do you get that often, Rachel, or do you feel that it's more consistent 
now for you? Yeah, well, I feel like a lot of, um, I still have to write a few paragraphs to to figure out what I'm actually trying to say. And it, it's like this run up, like I'm working on an article right now and it's like, you know, I'm four paragraphs in and I'm like, God, this isn't really what I wanna say yet. And I think part of that is finding what I want to say, but also finding, you know, coming back to, okay, what, what, how do I want to say this? What mm -hmm. tone am I using? So there, it's not, it, it doesn't mean I just sit down and like the words just flow. It, you know, it's yeah, still, for it's always, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's still a, a constant writing, rewriting, writing the paragraph again. Like there, there are a couple of sentences um, yeah, there are two sentences more than that, but like where I have spent like an hour on just two sentences because it's like, ah, oh, it's not right. And I know, I know like I can almost hear it in my head and I'm not there yet. And the, I think another part of voice is the rhythm of your writing, which I'm finding is the hardest thing to explain and to grasp and to teach. We can talk about, it's easy to pick out, like I talk a lot about strong verbs and strong nouns and less about adverbs. It's more about strong um, nouns and verbs, but there's a rhythm to our voice that when you're reading a piece and the rhythm is working and is right, you're just with it. And if it's, if the rhythm is off, if you're reading, you know, long sentence, long sentence, long sentence. You're just reading all these long sentences or the flip side, you're reading short, 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 short. It, it, it's, it's just not working, but it's hard to, it's hard to teach rhythm. You, you almost have to just find it. So like in your piece, it's, there's, there, you can think of it visually like, okay, I had a really long sentence. Now I should probably have a short sentence, but that's also wrapped up in your voice like how you say things like if you're someone who um if it just comes out naturally that you would use short punchy sentences or you're more academic and you have more of a flow and it's meandering and it's or is it really to the point like but a lot of that has to do with rhythm which i don't think you can learn a, a, any other way by just by doing it and by practicing it, it. yeah, yeah. And there, yeah, there, there are parts in my manuscript. If I, if I feel like, oh, this is good, but the rhythm is off, I will actually put like dash, dash, dash. If I'm, if I'm writing a paragraph, I'm like, it needs three more syllables. Otherwise it doesn't, it doesn't sound complete or needs two. I'll just dash, dash, dash. And then I know it's a rhythm thing. It's just not working unless that's, yeah. Unless I close that. Yeah. And I think reading out loud too helps you hear hear it versus just reading it on the page. So um, Space said, I am I am just pondering, but I wonder if you'd agree finding your voice is sort of like finding your confidence in who you are mm -hmm. and not needing to concern yourself with who is in the room or how they may perceive you. Yeah, I definitely would agree. Yeah, and yeah, it's hard to shut off the voices in our head, like shut off what is... My mom gonna think about this. What is my friend gonna think about? Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's you do have to shut those off and just again, it goes back to write for yourself initially, and that's not a bad thing. That's that's where it needs to start. Yeah, that's really good. Well, tell us a little more what you're gonna share with us um, on Thursday. We are going to talk about the building blocks of fiction. So we will look at the essentials of what any story needs to have and what drives a story. And um, we'll, we'll also talk about some how to, like we talked a little bit about it today, but how to get started and what are some, maybe some tricks or skills that you can develop to enhance that part of your writing. Um, I think it's obviously it's it's geared more towards fiction writers or people who are curious about fiction, but I really think nonfiction writers would benefit from taking a close look at what does it mean to tell a story 
and what's the difference between a well-told story and a good story and one that's not holding your interest uh, because our fiction writing should contain elements of story even if it's not an example or an anecdote that's like a really obvious part and and your fiction or your nonfiction usually should contain that but also in terms of metaphor and simile and word picture and um maybe even dialogue you know it's it's just it's discovering how to incorporate those story elements into uh, nonfiction in a way that engages our readers. That sounds great. Yeah, I see that um, being a really valuable tool for nonfiction writers to, to pay attention to as well. So I just wanna use the, you know our last few minutes together um, just to open it up and have you guys unmute and um, ask questions, comments. Christina, you asked a question right right when I was asking her what she's going to teach. So I would have asked that for you, but why don't you kick us off? And you left a question in the comments. So this is in regards to rhythm. Is that one of those things that you discover is off when you read it aloud? Or is it just reading it to yourself silently that you discover that? You reading it out, out loud would be the best way to go because you you would hear it more. You would hear it. Um, I mean, hopefully, the you know, as you write, your your internal ear will pick up on it without even having to read it out loud. But reading it out loud, you should be able to hear it. And the other thing you can, I think, this is valuable, is to look at your manuscript and and maybe just pull out something that you've you've written. Don't write something new, just pull out something you've already written and just check and see, like, you know, underline all the red or underline all the long sen sentences in red and short and green or whatever. Just see like where you fall. And, and it is, um, rhythm is organic. It, it, that, it makes it sound like it should just come, you know, we just, as we're writing the rhythm comes, but we can force the rhythm in terms of like, taking a long sentence and dividing it up into three short sentences or two medium sentences. Um, and that will, yeah, I think that will help teach yourself, like, what does it mean to, to find a rhythm? If that makes sense. Yeah. So if you're finding- like Reading out loud is always like, always read your stuff out loud. Always, 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 for so many reasons. Yeah. I was curious too, when you were saying about finding your voice, having, having written multiple books, is your voice the same in each of those books? Is it, or is it evolving? How do you keep from having the, you know, characters be the same, like copies of themselves in different, in different books? Is it just totally based on how different the plot is or? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, Yeah, I think part of it is I do I do identify with the characters. So I I do feel like in in some ways if I'm writing in especially first person present tense, which is what this novel is and it's also what my not the first one, but the middle one was first person present tense. Especially from that, like it very much sounds like my voice. So in a way that's that's fair, that it is kind of me. Like it's like, if I think, oh, this is really funny, I'm gonna put this, it, it's, it kind of feels like it's a little bit me, even though like in this instance, it's a 12 year old girl. So I'm making sure that, or trying to make sure that this is coming from a 12 year old girl's head. Um, but I think your, in fiction, it also incorporates your other characters will have their own unique voice. So, when I'm, if you're writing a character that, you know, is a crabby old lady, she's not going to sound like, she's not going to sound like your 12 year old. She's, she's going to have her own distinct voice. I think it's more in just the, uh, the narrative and those internal bits. Um, but I, I think that my, like your nonfiction blog article and fiction, there is a similarity 
Like it does feel like it's coming from the same person. And I think like I was reading um, some letters from Harper Lee and it still sounded like the woman who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, even though they were letters, like it still sounded like her. So it, it does carry through. Yeah, I don't know if that really answered your question. Yeah. Oh no, that's fine. I was just curious because because of the multiple book thing, I wondered if that was harder to to have a distinct voice for each book. Well, and I think the characters have different voices, right? Is what maybe it, what you're saying, Kathy? Like yeah. the characters all talk differently, right. but you as the writer are conveying who these characters are. And so you as the, what it, what does it call like the impersonal third eye? Like there's like some um, phrase where it's kind of like you're lifted up out of the story and you're the kind omniscient. of, that's it. The, yeah, the omniscient third person. Yeah. Third person. Yeah. 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 That, that is the, the consistent voice, right? But your all your characters can be very diverse in language and tone and cadence and all of those things. Is, is that correct, Rachel? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Even like I was saying, even writing in first person, um, the characters should, you should be able to, to pick out who said what by the end of the book, you know, like, you know, who said what and how they said it. Cause you, the characters should be developed. So, you know, mm -hmm. you know, their voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess in, in that, in that realm, I wouldn't, worry too much about, about finding voice like it, it shouldn't be on the forefront of your mind you shouldn't be thinking oh I need to find my voice just you know just write <laughs> it, <laughs> and it, it will come as you write so it, yeah because that's almost like that just takes the joy out of it if it's this struggle of like oh I have to find my voice I mean you you do have a voice it just maybe it's developing and I mean so is mine even though I feel like I, I can see growth in mine um, it, it, it should be developing. Like what I write 10 years from now, I would hope is better than what I write now. Like I'm hope, I hope it, it's still developing and growing. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all have a voice, like it's there. It's just kind of, uh, honing that and making your, your voice distinctive to other voices, but don't, don't worry about it. Don't, try to find it. I was thinking about, um, as you were talking about finding your voice about how um, I used to be a really terrible singer. I probably still am, but I met this lady who was in her eighties when I was in my like early twenties. And she stood in the back of the church and she sang with her guts out. She was so off key and she just didn't even care. Like she was just blasting her whole heart out to the Lord. And I remember thinking like, ah, oh, like that must be the most lovely voice in this whole church to Aww. Jesus. And, um, and I stopped overthinking whether or not I sounded good. And I actually started singing better um, as a result of it. I mean, I still am not like anybody that you'd ever want to put on the stage, but I stopped caring as much. And, um, and I wonder like if you guys have kind of like, if your brains are going in the same direction that mine is in thinking that maybe we overthink the whole finding our voice thing so much that we become really insecure about whether or not we sound good. And then we end up sounding terrible because, because we're repressing, um, who we are in an effort to sound really eloquent. And, um, the whole sanctification process, I was also thinking, I know I'm kind of rambling and you guys can, um, like, I don't even know how to ask this in question form or like, just even like, uh, I'm, basically I'm asking if you agree with me, I guess. Um, but I was thinking about the sanctification process and how we start with who God made us to be. And that eventually develops into more wisdom, more holiness, more, um, we become better communicators. We become better at, um, being humble or loving or whatever over time, but it doesn't really change like our personality. And, mm -hmm. um, what I think I hear you saying in a lot of ways, Rachel is like, you write, like, it's not just 
like to to figure out what your voice is supposed to sound like but that your voice would be unearthed like um like the more we walk with jesus the more all this fleshly crap gets scraped off and the more we understand who we were created to be yeah that yeah amen. That. totally agree yeah and i i mean that's that's a whole component that i know others have talked about it in their time too just allowing allowing god's spirit to guide what we're going to say and how we're going to say it and um one of the things you just said we're going to talk about on thursday is this we we kind of have to fight against not trying to sound clever and not trying to sound intelligent and creative and so you know because it just it doesn't that trying hard writing just doesn't work Mm -hmm. um and it's really hard not to to because our our motivations are you know i want to get better at this i want this to to come across right. And it's, you know, it, it's where we're all going to probably start, but it's, it's kind of toning that down of like, I don't need to sound clever, you know, using the biggest, most impressive word, isn't gonna make this better. It's, it's, it's speaking the truth from my voice. And I don't mean that in a weird way. I mean that just like, what is God, you know, what is God laid a laid on my heart to write what has he opened the doors what opportunities what audience whether it's like a big audience or a small audience of my sunday school class or or my family i want to write this letter to my family like what you know what has god laid upon my heart to explore through writing and letting him guide that without thinking oh i really want to show who I am because that could yeah that can very much become an idol of trying to find our voice and to sound you know to sound good and to sound clever um so yeah good word thinking about this idea of of finding the voice and space talking about singing um that's something I've been learning how to do lately and I think that it's similar in that Part of singing is discovering like what your resonating note is. You know, like where is that sweet spot for your voice specifically? And everybody has one. Like, you know, you have this natural sound that comes out um, when you hit it. And I think that writing has that same thing to it, that you get to this point where you're like, this really resonates with me. And once it resonates with me, then it becomes amplified so that other people can hear it as well. And, you know, it, it's it's really kind of amazing how the more we write, it's not about the writing itself, it's about the listening to ourselves. Like the more we listen to ourselves, the more we can hear when we resonate. And then that is the voice itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good way to look at it. What about, um, and I think we're on this voice theme, but I'm going to stay with it for a minute. Um, I used to, I don't anymore. I used to ask my husband to kind of proofread and I don't mind at each spell checks and, and that kind of thing, but he's always trying to change what I perceive as my voice. Hmm. And so I went, I love you, but um, I, I, I don't want to change it. That's the story. I want to, I want to know, do I have the right tense all the way through? Do I have, you know, I want that kind of thing. And um, um, it's, it's, <laughs> well, what can I say? Yeah. Just yeah, being vulnerable he, here. Um, he doesn't read my stuff anymore until I'm ready to post it. And he goes, well, I would have done it different. And I said, I know <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't have been I'm, my voice. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things. Sorry. No, that's a, that's very very valid, that that yeah. does happen, and I, I wonder if he would want to write. Maybe he wants to write, because <laughs> I've had yeah, that yeah. same conversation with family members. Like, well, if I want to say it like this, if you want to say it like this, write your own thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nicer than yeah. that, hopefully. But you know, the it's... one thing that he's really good at is he's he's really good at getting me to take out extra words. It was one of those little teachings Kara posted this week, and I went, oh, oh I do that, and um. So that's a valid, you know, valid to a point. Yeah. But if it, if some of that is part of your voice, if it's just, you know, without it being wrong, I don't want it to be grammatically wrong, but if it, if short sentences 
are more your thing, then that's what you do. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I was like, well, okay. Yep. No, I, I agree with you. I, I, I mean, you're, you're right to say, nope, this is my voice. I, I mean, I, I said that to my editor, he changed something. He wanted to lengthen a scene and he wrote something and it was actually really beautiful. But I said, this is, and I said, this is really beautiful writing, but that is not my voice. And so I changed it and he, he was fine with it. Um, so there is that recognition that it, oh, it doesn't, yeah, there, it can be, it doesn't mean it's even worse or better writing. It's just not from you. And if you, it, I mean, if you're aware of that, it's not your voice, that's a good thing that you're aware that like you hear something and you're like, that's how you would say it, but I would say it like this. That's a really good thing. So yeah, keep doing that in kindness, you know? Yeah. I love him to death. Sometimes I just don't like his opinion. <laughs> well, this has been really sweet. We're we're over the hour mark and it's been really fun to have this conversation. And Rachel, thank you so much for leading us out. And we're excited to learn more about just these these building blocks of story and I know we're all affected by story every single day. So I think this will be really, uh, really a blessing to us all. So thank you all for being here. And Rachel, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was great. Thanks for, for See by. you all on Thursday. Mm -hmm.